Hi, and welcome back for our next episode of Behind the Baton. Thank you so much, everyone who viewed our first one. And I'm back here with Maestro Troy Quinn. Troy, how are you today? I'm doing great, Tim. It's great to be back and chat with you. It's nice to have some live people to talk to these days. <laughs> <laughs> You're still stuck in your attic upstairs, I see, but I hope everything's going well out in California. Everything's well, it's calm, and um, you know, we're just biding our time, waiting patiently till we can safely get back to making music. But you know, it's, I feel like a man without a country right now. No orchestra, no, no uh, collaboration, but I know it's going to happen soon, and kind of nice to take some downtime and reflect. Now, what have you been doing in this downtime? We always joke around and say, if I only had the time, I would have done that. Has there any been any new, uh, any new ventures that you've tackled in this time? Yeah, actually, totally non-musical. I'm, uh, you know, doing all the things I've always wanted to do but never had time, like relearn Italian. Um, I'm cooking a lot and, and, and learning new recipes. And so um, I'm also a big cyclist, so I'm about to get another... Uh, bike and and uh, take to the beach which is right now open so um, you know things that I usually don't get to do because I'm sitting over here reading scores and uh, and learning new music but it's been nice actually and refreshing to sort of just take uh, take some reflection on what's what's happened and uh, and where we're going now I, I like this. It might be a future episode of I, I see it now. Troy Quinn cuisines. I mean, we could have something here. But what what would be your go-to meal that you've learned to cook lately? Actually, I and I love Italian food, so I just made eggplant parmesan, which is my mom's recipe, grandmother's recipe. So um, yeah, that and and I love cooking Thanksgiving dinner, even when it's not Thanksgiving. Roasted turkey, mashed potatoes, all the trimmings. So that's been keeping me busy. But my wife's happy, so that's good. <laughs> so, Troy, we all know where you are today, you know, as the, as the music director of the Venice Symphony, but how did that journey begin? How did you decide to go into conducting? You know, I've just been reflecting a lot, actually, on that, Tim, and it's such an unorthodox journey, at least for me, or you end up where you least expect. And, um, you know, for me, I started my world in music as a vocalist. Uh, a very long, far cry from orchestras. And um, when I was 12, I had a very um, life-changing experience. I went with my parents on vacation to Los Angeles, where we have family. I used to go every year. And I saw John Williams at an open rehearsal at the Hollywood Bowl. And I was actually, I was 13 years old, just, just turned 13. And I remember him conducting and my parents bringing me, and I didn't know who John Williams was. I never heard an orchestra before. It was, I was kind of late. Um, and you know, I, all he did was start off dun, 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 you know, the Indiana Jones theme. And I heard that and I thought, wow, that is the coolest job. I want to do that. But of course, I had just been singing in choirs and in churches and, and not trained at all. So I thought I really would love to be doing that and back at the Hollywood Bowl one day and have all these crazy delusions of grandeur. But that started off my journey into that was there was something more than just the vocal world. So um, really what happened was after I got my degrees in voice from Providence and Manhattan School of Music, I went back to Providence College as a 23-year-old green special lecturer conducting the chorus and teaching other music classes. And then I said, I really want to do this conducting thing, but I don't have any experience. So how do I do that? Let me just start my own orchestra. And it, it kind of went like that, Tim. I just woke up one day and said, let me do that. So I did that and it became the Ocean State Symphony in Rhode Island. We had seven great successful years and one of wonderful colleagues, I managed to get a lot of players from Boston Pops orchestras and the Rhode Island Philharmonic on their off time, mostly during the summer. Um, and we put on concerts at uh, Portsmouth Abbey School, a boarding school that I taught at for two years. And I went back every summer to do that, even while I was here in California working on my doctorate. So um, that was incredible because I got to work with these great artists and concert masters and great musicians, Boston Pops people had 40 years in the orchestra, and here I am trying to put together an orchestra uh, for my own knowledge. So I really learned on the job, and that sort of catapulted me into coming to LA, and then from there, actually doing it professionally. That's so cool. So you started 
this your own orchestra how did people what do they think when here's this 23 year old guy who's just trying to start this startup event how was it successful were there some bumps in the road how was that definitely they thought i was crazy and everybody's question was who is this guy you know um <laughs> what does he do he thinks he can conduct brahms and beethoven and 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 then you know this was the initial thing and um and then they saw me on the podium and i think once once we all got our bearings and saw that I, you know, could musically handle it, and, and everybody respected that. Because at the end of the day, the, the musicians, of course, want to work, but they, they really want to work with people that are not only great musicians, but, um, you know, love their craft and love making music. So I think that came through on the podium. And then, you know, I still have people now saying, I wish we could do this again. And, you know, obviously I had to leave that post after my time being so busy but um it was really enjoyable and it, and it got a great following i mean it started from the ground up i was the conductor the music librarian i was raising the funds you know sixty thousand dollars over the several years i mean it was really you know we put on a couple of concerts and chamber concerts and you know my uh, we did we did the walton henry v suite which is one of my favorite pieces my dissertation was on walton so i got to sort of really fine tune my own craft and work on things i might not normally have and um and really learn that was so valuable for me to be making mistakes in a somewhat safe environment and 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 really getting on the job experience because you can't really do that you know conductors have to make their mistakes in public always even in the rehearsal it's not like i can practice here you know i mean once you're in front of the orchestra the podium time is so valuable you don't have time to figure things out you need to know exactly what you're doing so you know uh, rhode island was very very influential for me and um you know it was wonderful we got a lot of support i got a rhode island foundation grant from the state and and so it was it was really taking off and and in wonderful collaboration with the philharmonic because that's the big orchestra there and and and, and the boston pops who, who lent us many players and so um you know, it was a great experience, and I miss it dearly. But I'm, I, I hope we can get back to doing those sometime in the near future. Now, you mentioned you traveled out to L.A. and saw, you know, John Williams. But you grew up in Connecticut, is that correct? I did, yeah. Born and raised in New Haven. So I'm a New England guy. New England guy. So tell me a little bit about, obviously, your family sounds like they were, they were Team Troy from the start. How, how has their support been through your whole journey? Yeah, well, I, I believe that's probably the biggest influencer in my life, Tim. My, my mom and my dad both are incredible uh, support systems and not professional musicians, uh, though my, my dad was a professional dancer and he actually met my mom uh, in his dance studio in 1978, I believe, and uh, they've been going strong ever since. So the arts brought them together and they've been very supportive. You know, when I first said in college, you know, mom and dad, I want to major in music. The reaction most parents get is, why don't you want to be a lawyer or a doctor? Uh, you're going to be an out of work, you know, musician. That's the stigma. But my parents were thrilled, you know, and certainly going into cl the classical world was a little different, but um, they were nothing but supportive and always front row center at, at my concerts. And, um, you know, my brother's also involved in music. He went to school for music theater in New York at NYU. And so, it's always run in our family. We were very musical, but nobody was really formally trained until you know I, I went to college and uh, and got the training. I had sung so young, probably from five years old, um, you know, as a choir boy in New Haven, and um, and so I really then turned my attention to learning the musical language and getting into the instrumental world you know um and then that took a whole other journey but growing up i was in the school plays i was doing you know all of the uh all of the shows and and all of the choir stuff and and you know and my piano skills are decent enough so i also did that in some of the bands but um yeah it was really an it, it was really all heading me towards where i eventually should be which is in front of the orchestra, but a very unorthodox way to go about it. Most orchestra conductors start playing violin or cello or, you know, uh, percussion. And so 
I have a different type of outlook on it, which in some ways is refreshing because I didn't grow up playing the Brahms symphony since I was five. So I had a different take when I learned them when I was older. It was sort of gave me a fresh new way to look at it. And I wasn't influenced by what I had done when I was younger. You know, sometimes when you learn a piece and, and you've got the bad habits that go towards that, you have to erase them. With orchestra conducting, I started as a blank slate, which was wonderful. And I was able to hone that, you know. Now, that's so cool. Now, uh, we're, we're gonna put down the baton for a moment here. Although we call this behind the baton. Right. I want to talk a little bit about some of the music things that you do that don't involve a baton or conducting. And we've noticed that in your office where you're recording from today, you have these really, really cool movie posters behind yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Tell right. us a little bit about, you know, you're in Hollywood. So tell us you know, about the, the, the film and business and the TV music business that you're in out there. Well, again, I, 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 took, I take off my conducting hat and put on the studio hat, which is totally I got into by accident, really. I mean, I had, I had loved film music growing up, obviously, with John Williams. And that sort of was my gateway into classical music. I would go to the movies with my dad. He would always play all these wonderful soundtracks. Um, my grandfather would be playing opera and movie soundtracks. So um, I was very influenced by that. So I was always aware of Henry Mancini and you know John Williams and Jerry Goldsmith and and so when I got to LA it was always my goal to get here but I didn't think I'd be singing on movies or working on TV or anything but USC really was the gateway to that and so um, that started my little career there in in the studio world and the first thing I I did was Glee really was the main thing which was a massive hit back in the day and um, you know, I have to confess, Tim, I've never really watched it. I've seen just bits and pieces of the episodes I was involved with. But, um, you know, that actually opened the door for a lot of these things. And so, you know, I was in the Chamber Singers at USC. And that's a f unbelievable group of, of the best singers in the country, really. I mean, Ch uh, Charles Hurt founded that uh, choir and people like Marilyn Horn have been in that choir. Um, Harv Presnell, who was in the unsinkable Molly Brown, great Broadway singer. Um, so it was real. It's got quite a legacy. And I started there, you know. And and some of these contractors would come in and ask my teacher, you know, who's up and coming? Who do you have? And and that sort of started it all. So I got hired by the wonderful Tim Davis to do Glee, and I did an episode of that, which was a wild experience. And then I went back and did a couple more. Um, and then that one thing led to another, you know, and after that it was doing, you know, The Voice and The Tonight Show and, and things like that. And most of the time I was singing on these things and most of the time putting my conducting baton on, which actually was very helpful, especially in the studio world as a conductor, because you got to sight read, you know, the Dickens off of these charts. And um, it's really important that you have those reading chops. So. For me, that was that was uh, a way to sort of hone those skills, and also I kind of was lucky in a way because I had done that at a at a high level with the orchestral repertoire. You know, reading twenty eight staves is a lot more difficult than reading four on an open choral score. So, um, you know, and and there's different challenges. Not to say it's easy; it's not at all. But um, you know, there's different skills, and so that kind of gave me a good basis to do this. Um, and one thing led to another and, you know, and uh, somehow I, I, I made it back home and, and have this little uh, exciting thing singing on some of these movies and TV shows, which was for me thrilling, you know, to be going to, you know, Fox Studio where I heard, you know, these uh, Johnny Mandel scores being recorded as a kid and, and to actually be there recording on them was just you know, it's still, I feel like I'm lucky to do that. It's the pinch me, you know, and, and they pay me for that. <laughs> I can't believe it, you know, so. So let's go back to this first gig you had at Glee. And I do remember that was a the big hit on, on Fox. and It's even available now on Netflix. So since, since it's just the two of us talking here, uh, tell me the truth here. So are those actors, are some, are they really singing? Are you guys replacing their voice? What's some of the inside magic that goes on to make a show like that such a hit? Yeah, man, that's a very interesting question because now the lead talent, I'd say 90% of the time is actually singing, but of course they're doing that in the studio and then laying it on top of the footage. Um, you know, I would probably say 
95% of the time, we are never singing live on anything. And if we are, we're overdubbing to our own track. So we're basically singing live or lip syncing to our own track. And that's just because there's so many things that can go wrong, especially when you're doing live TV. Um, with Glee, it was interesting because usually I would get hired to actually sing and, and not be on television. So the folks that you are seeing in the background lip syncing or, or singing on television, the dancers aren't really singing. They're, they're, they're the singer's voices. Um, but for this episode particularly, it was kind of unusual because we actually were all hired as singers. Um, and I remember actually one of the fine singers, Mitch Grassi, who's now in Pentatonix, was on this episode. Funny enough, um, some, some viewers will remember him and, and some other wonderful people. But we were all singers, yet we were actually lip syncing to another track. It wasn't even us singing, which was unusual. Um, most of the time when we're in the studio, we're the ones singing, and then they lay that on top of whoever the actors are. So it's, it's, it's kind of separate between actors and singers. Um, but Glee kind of meshed those worlds because I remember on that particular episode, we were supposed to do it live, but we were actually were supposed to sing, but it was, it was the producers I don't think wanted to take too much of a risk. So, and that's like that everywhere. You know, when I did The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, now I'm dating myself, but before Jimmy Fallon, um, again, we did a show with Jackie Ivanko, who's now probably 21 years old, but at the time she was 10 or nine, opera singer. Um, and we actually performed that show live, but we, we sang to our own track that was recorded in Sweden. So that's kind of the secrets of uh, Hollywood without giving out too much. It's really controlled. Now that's why I love live performance, Tim, because you know, in the orchestra world, Anything can happen, and that's the excitement of it. You know, when you're recording, there's not much um, leeway. And it's stress. It's very high stress. Much more stressful than doing a, a Beethoven or even a Mahler symphony, at least for me, because, you know, the time is money, of course, and sometimes you have one chance to get it right. Uh, I remember just working on The Call of the Wild just a few months ago. John Powell was, uh, did the music, the remake of the Jack London film, uh, book rather, and um, you know, John Powell writes beautiful music, and 90% of it's very readable, but then there's one cue in there, which there was, you know, we had to do quite a few takes on it, and it, you know, that's where you really earn your money, on that cue that's almost unreadable, so, um, but that's, you know, that's a little bit about the behind the scenes and, and how those things happen. So my eagle-eyed viewers, I'm going to give you a hint. It was season three, episode 14, wow. but halfway through, you're going to see uh, young Troy dressed up as a magical singer. <laughs> I think you're on the right side in the second row. It's about 14 seconds of magic, but he, that's it. He's on there. We see you. Wow, you did your research, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Stalking, research, whatever you want to call it. You know? yeah, I remember that. Another that, really, yeah, that another big perfect. phenomenon that uh, you were involved with is, is still on TV, and that's The Voice, which is that show where we have, the, you know, we have stars like Anne Levine, and they got the spinny chair and stuff, and you were involved with that production. Tell us a, a little bit about that one. Yeah, that was fun, too. Um... It was a, several years ago now, and it was in the earlier seasons. We were backing up James Wolpert, great singer. I don't know what happened to him, but um, we were doing um, Freddie Mercury's um, Somebody to Love. And, uh, and, and so that is a very difficult song to sing, as you know, and he was singing the lead. But um, in the vocal world, the, the backup charts for it are also very, very involved and intricate and, and a lot of overdubbing on that so you know my voice range is, is a pretty high tenor so that's why I sometimes get called to do that stuff um, but that's a screamer I remember that was very fun what was interesting about that shoot is that again we actually were on TV and we were singing to our own track um, but we were singing live um, we had recorded it before and um, <laughs> the funny thing is everybody wanted, uh, and this is what happens when you work in TV, you got to be ready for anything. You know, they wanted everybody to look like James, who had glasses, straight hair, and I do not have straight hair or glasses. So I I'm in, you know, makeup for probably about an hour, and they're flat ironing my hair to make it look straight and poofy and wear glasses like him. So we all, all the backup singers, 
and the dancers had to look like that. So that was kind of fun, and uh, that was at NBC. But, um, you know, when you're doing these things, it's, it's, of course, you're in the moment, and, and the excitement of doing live television is, is kind of like live performance. But there's a lot more distractions, I find, than when I'm on the podium. You know, you really have to think about it, and, of course, all this stuff is being memorized. So, you know, obviously the track is there in case something goes wrong. For, for us, you know, not for the lead singer, but, um, or lead instrumentalist, but, um, it can be a, it can be a tightrope to walk those, oh, wow, you're in the moment performing, but also I have to not let my emotion get too far off, otherwise I'm going to forget what's happening, so, um, there's always a balance there, but it's, uh, very enjoyable. And you've been to magical places, you've recorded at the famed Capitol Records out there, you've worked with artists like Barry Manilow, and Josh Groban and, and on the Tonight Show, it's amazing. But what I think is so cool is this whole journey has come full circle for you. And from going to, you know, not only to the Hollywood Bowl and seeing John Williams, but you've actually played and, and sung on an Indiana Jones movie theme. Is that correct? Yeah, that's an interesting story, actually. It, was, it had a very non-musical role in Indiana Jones in the last one. Uh, Tim, which is, I'm forgetting the title, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, actually. Um, and, you know, I'm from New Haven, and they filmed half of that film in New Haven, Connecticut. So, again, I just put in to be an extra at the time. My brother and I thought it would be a fun thing to do. Um, and completely non-musical uh, role happened where they picked me to be an extra, and I... And I was, and I thought, this is cool, I'm just going to be <laughs> on set, and they filmed it at Yale, and, you know, five minutes from my house, uh, where I grew up, and I'm a huge Harrison Ford fan, and, and John Williams music fan, so I thought it would be great to be part of it, and then the first day on set, I, I get a, I, somebody comes and grabs me, and brings me in this trailer, you know, with these producers and stuff, and says, we want you to be a stand-in for Shia LaBeouf, you, you know what that is, right, and I said, yeah, I had no clue what that was, or this is a whole new world. You know, I'm not really an actor. I just fake it once in a while. I mean, I'm, my comfort spot is on the podium, but um, in this case, I just went with it. And it turns out, basically, uh, on these shoots for the main actors, they need somebody to come in when they set up the lighting and the technical aspects, and Spielberg, who directed it, gets the camera angles and all that, and not waste the actor's time. So that was sort of my role, and I was in their costume, and you, you, you know, on the special features DVD to get the behind the scenes. And now I usually don't appear in the film because the stunt doubles would actually be doing that type of doubling. But um, in this one instance, it was very unusual. They were filming at Woolsey Hall in New Haven, and they were filming this scene in the movie where the um, where Harrison Indiana Jones is with Mutt Williams, who is Shia LaBeouf's character. And he's driving, they're trying to escape the, I think it's the Russians or the Nazis or somebody. And, um, and they come crashing into the library. They actually drive through the library, the motorcycle, and come crash. So that was the scene that, for whatever reason, this one day, the stunt double did the scene. And then after it, they called me in to set up the shots and the camera. And for whatever reason, because Harrison Ford also has a stand-in, they brought in Harrison and myself to actually do and practice the scene and run some things. And they did film some of it from the back. So I actually made it in there and it, it was an incredible thing before Shia came in to actually shoot the, the real movie scene. Um, but just to rehearse it with Harrison right there, I mean, that's like, it's like meeting your kind of idol there, at least in the acting world. I mean, you know, that's Han Solo, that's Indiana Jones. And, and here he is saying, Troy, can you move your body this way so we can get the motorcycle up? You know, and the other thing to this, Tim, is I had to sign off on a waiver, uh, and I'm probably giving away a secret here, when they said, you ride, do you ride a motorcycle? And I said, yes, I can do that. I've never ridden a motorcycle in my life. <laughs> I just went with it. And, you know, at the time, uh, this was in 2007 we shot it, so... Um, you know, I didn't realize I never driven a motorcycle, but it was completely inside. It was very safe. You know, they had buoys and, you know, a pulley system that you wouldn't go off the track. So, um, I, I managed not to kill Harrison Ford. We rehearsed it. I drove away in the motorcycle and then they shot the scene for real. But that was my 10 minutes of fame for not a non-musical role in, in that, uh, which was really a thrill, you know. 
we have now yet another scene to look for in a movie. So now and I think that was on Netflix too. So I know what I'm doing later today. That's incredible. And of course, um, and then you were back performing at the Hollywood Bowl, part of the, the DreamWorks Spectacular event that they had there as well. Yeah, that was an incredible journey. Um, Edie Lehman Boddicker, who's a wonderful contractor here, um, hired me to do that. And that was fun because it was a, a real live concert, of course, but it was at the Hollywood Bowl. So to be actually performing on that stage was just a special moment for me. And, and really special is because it was, I think, the 25th anniversary of DreamWorks, or 20th, I'm forgetting now. Um, you know, it was probably the greatest assembly of film composers, minus John Williams, of all time. Anybody who's worked on a DreamWorks um, film had been there, and we had played their, their film music. So, Alexandra Desplat, you know, um, John Powell, and Hans Zimmer, and Danny Elfman, and all of these, the best film composers and you know and 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 most of them conducted their own things Alan Silvestri so that was just an incredible concert um to be a part of and 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 Jack Black was there of course and he's a riot just to just to see in action and um and so yeah that was a special concert for me you know it's one of those things you know you've made it when you're on the back of the Hollywood Bowl and you're back up singing for the cast of Madagascar, including giant penguins, and that's when you know you've finally made it, right? Exactly. When there's penguins and pandas on stage, you can't go wrong. But, you know, the truth of it is, Tim, this is a, it's such an incredible world to, to delve into. I, I'm happy to be in the room. And if I'm 99 out of 100, which is most of the time is what I am, I am, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to be there. And, and uh, so it's my little contribution. But it's uh, certainly for a young kid, film nerd from you know new haven connecticut and music lover you know to have that opportunity was uh and continues to be very special so that's, that's why i put up with the track. that's wonderful <laughs> so the, i've enjoyed asking you questions but one of the nice things about our our little episodes here is we have the maestro mailbag which the link is for right in the description of this and we want you to have your chance to answer uh, you know, ask a question to Troy that he can answer. So I have a couple here. I feel like Letterman here, like I'm going to throw it at the screen. So this is from Joan in Venice. Uh, Maestro, we miss you because I love preludes. In my opinion, it's some of the richest, most romantic, most beautiful music ever written. Do you have a pre prelude? Or what is your favorite style of music that you like to listen to or perform? Oh, that's a good question, Joan. Oh, yeah, there are so many. Um, well, you know, typically preludes come before an opera or a, a piece of music, um, but Liszt wrote quite a few, and they're long. They're not like a three-minute prelude or intermezzo, um, but uh, Liszt's Symphony Prelude Number 3 is one of my favorites. And also, not a prelude, but, a, but an intermezzo in between opera acts is um, Cavalleria Rusticana, the intermezzo from that by Mascagni. It's just a, one of the most beautiful pieces ever written. So um, <clears throat> we're actually going to be doing a few of those pieces uh, this year on our Game of Rome's concert. Some Italian music, but also some preludes and intermezzos. So we're, we're excited that you've been practicing your Italian and actually part of our Meet the Musicians um, series, Amy Collins demonstrates the oboe solo from Cavalera Rusticana as well. So it's well, we're coming full circle here. This is awesome. wonderful. Yeah, right, exactly. And of course, yeah. the great Ennio Morricone just passed away couple of days ago I should mention that he's one of my favorite composers and uh, Gabriel's oboe is so beautiful we'll be doing that as well later this year another question we have is from uh, Mark in Nicomas and uh, although you're out in sunny beautiful California he has when you visit Venice what are your some of your favorite things that you like to do or places you like to go ah that's a good question Mark yeah well, number one is the beach. I'm always at the beach. I'm a, I'm a beach guy. So, um, and what I love about the Gulf water is you can actually swim in it and go in it. So, you know, I stay at the Great Inn at the beach. They take wonderful care of me, and I'm literally right on the beach within a minute. So that's my first stop. Um, you know, and for lunch, I have these little places that I love to just kind of go, and one of them is the soda fountain. I just love the throwback to the 50s, and... You know, the, pe the people there are great, the staff, and, uh, and I get my, you know, 
turkey and grilled cheese sandwich and salad and, and I'm happy for the day. Um, and then usually I eat after rehearsal, Tim. So I'm not a big eater before performance or rehearsals. Um, and, 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 and I'll usually go to Finn's at Sharky's and the beer is gorgeous there. Um, either that or if it's really late, our, our hangout spot really now with the orchestra is, um, is um, made in Italy. You know, we, we love going there after concerts. So, and having the, uh, the chicken parmesan is the best, I think, in town. So, yeah, I'm really, I'm really enjoying uh, getting to know Venice and, and becoming more part of the community there. It's such a beautiful place. I mean, that, that whole Sarasota County is just so gorgeous. You know, we're very lucky to, to be there. Now, we're lucky to have you here as well, and it's beautiful, and I love the fact that, that we live where, where people vacation, and it's, exactly. it's wonderful, and one of those things that you just, every once in a while, have to pinch yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, right, Tim. Now, you first saw John Williams in concert years ago, but this past year, we were hoping to have a John Williams concert that unfortunately got canceled. Um, one of the questions that I've received is, will, is there a plan to have that rescheduled in the future? 100% absolutely. Um, you know, I have a very biased view of his music, but the, the, the orchestra loves it, the audience loves it, and you know, John's now 88 and we'll certainly celebrate his music. It will be rescheduled definitively for the 21-22 season. And most likely it's going to be since, you know, we have our season scheduled this year, it'll be probably in the spring of 2022. So once we get through this year, we will be programming it next year. And I may tweak things and put in a few more things. That's one of those programs, Tim, where it could go on for a day. You know, I think I'm going to add this and add this. And then all of a sudden you've got a two hour program. So, but there's just so much great music of his and, uh, uh, certainly now the greatest living film composer to celebrate. So we will be um, rescheduling that concert for 21-22 season. We look forward to it. Remember, if you have a question for Troy, please click on the link in the Maestro mailbag, and I would love to have your question said and shared on the air. Uh, Troy, as we wrap up here, it's so neat to, to talk about the things uh, not only you know behind the baton, but those items that happen you know when you're not conducting. And we look forward to these conversations to learn more about you as the person and the musician. And uh, again, your time is wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing it with us today. Thanks for taking the time, Tim. I'm so grateful and and, and really eager to get back on the podium and see everybody in Venice soon. Wonderful. Well, from all of us at the Venice Symphony, thank you so much for joining us today and have a wonderful time.